Hello and welcome to another episode of the Bishy P podcast. Um, we're absolutely buzzing to have uh, Hannah Miley, three-time Olympian and two-time Commonwealth champ, um, our first swimmer who's just on the Bishy podcast and episode number 27. Hannah, how are you doing? Thanks for joining us. No worries. Thank you very much for having me. 27, you guys have been pretty busy. Uh, we're, we're, we're surviving, that's for sure, we're surviving. Um, we're also joined by current S4 pupil and National 5P pupil, Remy Muirhead. Remy, how are you doing, pal? I'm good. Fantastic. And we're also joined by uh, my colleague and good friend, Mr. Irvin. Mr. Irvin. Hello, everyone. Good? Yeah, good, thanks. Very good. Um, I think it's, we've also, we've came prepared today as well, Hannah. Um, yeah. A couple of hats here. Ah, nice. Yeah. <laughs> and I Grant, Grant's going to ask the first question. Yes, Grant. Yeah, are we? Yeah. So uh, I'm just going to ask you about your time at school, Hannah. Yeah. Um, so tell us a bit about your journey through school. So I went. So I brought up in Inverurie. So I went to a little primary school called Market Place, and then progressed on to Inverurie Academy. Yeah. Um, Started at S1. I was kind of the kid that always wanted to sit at the front. Uh, I always loved being a little bit different, and I always loved setting myself away from the the, the main group. Um, we always used to have a, a group of girls that always had the Jane Norman bags. Um, yeah. I always had to have the biggest backpack ever. I don't know why. I just really enjoyed having a massive backpack, and I fitted all my books in it. Um, and yeah, and I just kind of figured out. I struggled a little bit with English. I love reading, but I think I've got a little bit of dyslexia, so my I could never really put what was in my head onto paper, or at least I thought I did, but then when you read over it, sometimes it can be a bit, bit gobbledygook. So I always struggled a little bit more with English, but um, would quite happily sit and read books all day. Love science. Yeah. Science was kind of like my main thing. So I took all three sciences. Um, so I was in the system where it was still standard grades, then you go from standard grade yeah. up to higher. And uh, for higher, I took all three sciences, so biology, chemistry, and physics, maths, uh, English, and I also took um, art as well. I really quite enjoyed doing art. Yeah. Um, after fifth year, that was obviously quite a big jump, uh, going from standard grade to higher. I then went and stayed on in sixth year and took psychology. Um, I attempted advanced higher maths and advanced higher biology. Had to drop oh. advanced higher maths. Um, yeah. <laughs> that just wasn't for me. Um, but really enjoyed advanced higher maths. And uh, and same with psychology, higher psychology. But so with swimming, I do a lot of training. And I, I got a little bit cocky. I thought I knew pretty much how to do advanced higher work. You know, you're given the information. And it's a bit, a bit of a jump. They do say advanced higher work is a little bit like going into first year uni work yeah. where yeah. you have to self-study. You've got to learn how to do it. So when it came to my prelim, I failed it spectacularly uh, to the point where I was actually told I possibly might not be even allowed to sit the final exam. So that was a huge wake up call for me. Um, yeah. And I realized that I had to rethink my strategy for studying and learning. And I really wanted to prove a point that I could do it because I love biology <clears throat> um, yeah. and ended up coming away from pretty much, I think was it like a, 27% from my prelim uh, and came away with a B. So uh, I yeah. was quite happy with that. So yeah, so I didn't really know what I wanted to do study work. Well, I wanted to become a vet. I knew that was one of the things I'd love to become. That was like the ultimate dream. But when my swimming started to kind of take off a little bit when I was about maybe 15, 16, um, I kind of saw that swimming was you know, a great opportunity. And because I love the sciences, I felt maybe I could study and learn a little bit more about my body and go towards sport. So I worked towards getting the grades to be able to work on uh, sport and exercise science, which I then did at university yeah. um, and then uh, got a bachelor's degree in that. But all the while, I still would love to be able to go back and work and try and do some extra studies, I think, to do with animals. But I loved studying for me in the afternoons, especially at lunch times. I was always the kid that would sit in the library. Um, yeah. I, I, for me, I quite enjoyed the peace and quiet. I was surrounded by books, which I loved. And also I could just get my homework done then and there. And it meant when I got home after training, I could actually enjoy a bit of peace and quiet in the evenings rather than yeah. being tired after training, having to then do extra homework. So, uh, so yeah, so I had fun time at school um, yeah. and different little bits. Uh, 
was part of the um, sort of school orchestra, played the flute for a little bit, right. did, um, some netball. I was the shortest member on the team. And for some reason, they put me on as goalkeeper. We never won right. a match. <laughs> Maybe it's your, it your position in the netball team. No. What's that? Centre. Centre. Yeah. I yeah. always want to be the centre. I loved. Uh, I would always want to be the centre, but I was always got put as the goalkeeper. So yeah, <laughs> All right. Good. No, a lot of really good, powerful messages there. Um, just with regards to the advanced hire. So, yeah. um, really interesting to hear, Hannah. Um, so, next question. You've spoke quite a lot about different subjects. Here. What would you say is your favourite subject at school? Biology. I really yeah. found biology quite fascinating. Um, the sciences were quite black and white and I did love the black and white side and whilst I enjoyed art and music and stuff the creative side for me I felt at my happiest just studying and understanding just biology whether it's in human or an animal or uh, you know sort of microorganisms or plants uh, for me I just understood and had a better understanding of biology which is weird yeah. considering as I say I absolutely flunked my advanced higher so yeah it goes to show that you have to put in the effort in order to get the results you can't skim it and get it for free <laughs> yeah brilliant Remy I think you're up next Paul uh, when you were younger did you have any part-time jobs uh, that's actually a good question. No, all of it was pretty much swimming based. Um, I never really had time to be able to have any part time jobs. I actually did envy a lot of the uh, young kids that would go around on the bikes doing the paper round. Um, but I lived um, about sort of on the outskirts of the town, so I, it wasn't somewhere something that I could just easily walk into town and just look for like a part time job that way. I had to rely on my mom and dad to drive me. Both of them were at work. I had two younger brothers as well, so it was difficult for me to try and manage school, swimming, and uh, sort of other chores and stuff that I had to do at home. Um, so for me, swimming was my job. Ultimately, it wasn't exactly well paid, uh, but every now and then you had some competitions where you got little bonuses if you break records, or yeah. uh, my granddad used to do a thing where if I broke a PB, I would get a pound. Um, I think he that didn't last long. <laughs> I think he kind of figured out that that was huge motivation for me. So um, <laughs> uh, if I did like four or five PVs, I found out I still only got like two quid at the end of it, and I was like, oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I didn't have really enough time uh, to go and do a part time job. I kind of wish I did, but those life choices that I made, I was fully focused and committed to my swimming. Um, yeah. So yeah. Good. What about you, Amy? Have you got any part time jobs? Oh. Nothing. Oh dear. Paint the dishes and keep yeah. them clean. That's what I <laughs> Anyway, I've got the next question here, Hannah. Um, I'm quite interested to find out how you get into swimming, like how it came about um, initially. Um, so it was to do with my dad. Um, he had a huge fascination with swimming when he was younger. He kind of was almost like a crazy inventor. He developed a device called an aqua pacer, which yeah. if uh, people do music it's almost like a waterproof metronome so you can program it where it just beeps at you and you think why on earth would you want to wear something that beeps at you but um, it gives you uh, an idea of pace so I can have it set at a set time so if I'm tumble turning at one end and it beeps and I know the timing it's set at I roughly know if I'm faster than that time or slower so whilst you're swimming, you know, if you're running, you can kind of roughly see times or the coach can maybe yeah. shout at you for times, how well you're going. It's quite difficult to do that in swimming. So right. it basically allows you to have a good feel for pace, but also for stroke rate as well. So basically how fast your arms are going. So you can practice like race simulation, racing at the speeds and the, how fast your arms are going uh, compared to a, a competition to when you're in training. So he worked with a lot of swimmers. So when I was born, um, the main focus for me and my younger brothers as we were growing up was to be confident around swimming, uh, sorry, around water. So being able to learn to swim was an important role just for a safety point of view. And also, you know, you want to go on holiday and enjoy water parks. Absolutely. You're surrounded by water anyway. You want to be able to go in the sea and be confident as well. Um, so it kind of grew from there. And I had lots of other activities, but my dad was just always so obsessed with swimming that I kind of felt like, Ah, nah, it wasn't for me. I, you know, I enjoyed doing my lessons at the weekend. He would take me for extra set swim sessions. But as I grew up, I found that I'm definitely more coordinated in water. I can trip over on a flat floor. I've got incredibly floppy ankles, which if you're running is not great because I, I just trip. I kick my ankles. I'm covered in bruises constantly. And there was just something about my imagination when I was in water that I just loved. 
Uh, I used to imagine I was a mermaid. I sometimes would imagine I was flying. And I just love the feel. And I was very, very competitive as well. And I love the fact that I was the only one who could swim reasonably well compared to my classmates, nice. especially the boys. And if I could do anything better than the boys, that was it. I was like, yep, that's for me. <laughs> um, so I was, I was very highly driven and very, very competitive. And I just felt more, it just felt more natural for me being in the water. And I enjoy the skill level. And the more you did it, the more effortless you can make it look. And just all the different little progressions you could make. And even though I kind of went against the grain and I was a lot smaller than some of my competitors, that made me want to do it more. Because again, a bit like being in school, I did like being a little bit different and standing out and not being afraid to be different. Yeah. Um, and I love being up against some of these big swimmers being like, I'm going to take you on <laughs> and try and beat them as best I could. Because if I did get to beat them, it just made me feel like, right, okay, my effort, my determination is there. Um, so yeah, so it, it just kind of evolved from, from just the, a young age and just trying to prove that I am just as tough and just as strong as some of these other you know, females and male swimmers and female male athletes around me as well. Um, and again, I just loved that it was different. You know, you had a couple of people that could mm -hmm. swim, but um, I, I kind of wanted to take it that next step further. <laughs> Yeah, brilliant. Can you just move it into your, your professional career? You said how it evolved. How did it then go into your kind of professional career um, in, yeah. in, in the last couple of years as well? Um, I think I was just always having that little target of, okay, what, what time do I need to get to qualify for district events to then qualify for national events? Okay, okay what, well, how fast do I need to go to try and you know, be on a podium? How, you know, then comparing myself to some of the other girls in the best of Scotland, the best in Britain, and then looking at, you know, other girls my age in the world. And it was always slightly more scary because there were always some girls that were just so quick and you think, oh, I can never do that. Yeah. But the more I set myself lots of little goals and targets to work towards and you suddenly realize I've, won I've achieved that. Okay, let's set another one. And then let's set another one. And eventually it just kind of grew that each year. We always have one meet that we try and focus on in the summer. So everything will be built up towards that. My dad becoming my coach as well, kind of his expertise and guidance. I trusted everything in him. Uh, I knew he knew what he was talking about. There was no way I was going to be able to argue with him. You know, he worked with Olympic athletes and developed a device in swimming. So I had no leg to stand on if I was to argue with him. But I, because of that, I fully trusted that he knew what he was talking about. And the fact that I was seeing successes. And yeah, there were some times where I had setbacks and uh, things didn't go according to plan. But instead of sitting and dwelling on them, I kind of used them as opportunities to learn from it and use that as a step forward rather than to hold me back. So I kind of knew my mindset was always a little bit different. And there were times where it was hard and it was tough. Um, but it got to about maybe 13, 14, where I had a chance to kind of break out into the British scene where you could race at what's called the European Youth Olympic Festival and then the European Juniors. Yeah. And there were set qualifying times that were always out. So when I was you know, 10 or 11, we kind of would look saying, oh, you know, it'd be great to get down to these times. And obviously they felt like they were, you know, a million miles away. But over time, I was slowly chipping away at them. And I realized that actually I was getting quite close to, especially the 400 IM. And when I was 14, I missed the qualifying time. I, I didn't make the cut. So I was just like, ah, right, I've got one more year to try and qualify for the European juniors. And uh, I, I managed to do it. And then from there, traveling abroad to Hungary to compete, wearing a GB hat, being part of a team where you've got people from not just Scotland, England, Wales, and it was just nice to kind of meet a whole heap of different people and swimmers and be able to train with them. And again, my competitive side, when I was training with these uh, new sort of teammates, my ego got like knocked up a little bit more. So I kind of wanted to be like, I want to beat them. I want to be just as quick as these guys. And it just seemed so much more exciting. So I had a chance to try and qualify for the Commonwealth Games for Scotland at the age of 16. And I managed to qualify. And I think it was at that point that I realized I'd taken my school books with me over to Melbourne uh, for the Commonwealth Games. And I realized, you know, I can study until I'm 99, but I can't necessarily swim at an elite level. So I thought I'm going to make the most of this opportunity and just see where my career takes me. Obviously not neglect my studies because it's important to have that safety net because I know I can't swim forever. But at the same time, I knew that this was an opportunity that was a once in a lifetime kind of thing. And, you know, you get to travel the world, you get to meet new people and, each competition that you try and target going towards, it just brings so many different opportunities, which has just been so exciting. So it's been one one really big adventure, actually. 
Um, yeah. And yeah, I'm still really enjoying it, still going with it. So I guess it wasn't something that I suddenly stated, I am now a professional athlete. It, it just happened that way that I kind of, I, I guess it must have been the Commonwealth Games at 2006. And I was like, okay, I, I kind of want to try and aim for an Olympic Games and take it to the next level. And let's just see where it goes. So yeah. I guess it was around that time. <laughs> Uh, Remy, back to you. What would you say is the best part about swimming? Um, I love how it's a whole body sort of exercise. I love that you not only feel physically good, you feel you work your arms, your core, your legs, but I feel it's a great release for your head. Um, you can kind of go into like your little bubble. And for me, especially coming into exam time, it was a great way to just have that break from studying to be able to either think a little bit about what you've been revising or just have that complete mental break and just enjoy being in the water. Um, and I think I just loved the difference and actually how challenging swimming can be. It's certainly probably one of the most unforgiving sports out there. And especially in lockdown, it's kind of highlighted how unforgiving it is. Um, during lockdown, you know, we're not runners. We can't just, oh, let's just go out for a run or let's maintain some of our fitness by just hopping on something on land. We physically need water. So it, it makes it very, very challenging. Um, so you need to constantly keep working at it. So for me, that's what I love about swimming. Uh, you definitely need a good mindset, mental toughness, be able to get up at those ridiculous hours in the morning to train before school. Hey, um, Hannah, um, Remy was just telling us she's quarter past five this morning. Yeah. Quarter past five to quarter past seven. And then she's first, first period this morning, PE. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be super fit. I mean, you'll be wide awake. And that's one of the things as well. Like you are, even though it is super early, you get set into a good routine. Yeah. You are probably one of the few pupils that will be wide awake first thing in the morning. So your morning classes actually might be pretty good. Towards the afternoon, you might start getting a wee bit tired because I know I used to. The amount of times I try to like rest my head in my hands and try and keep my eyes awake, <laughs> um, especially if the classroom got really, really hot. But yeah, I, I love the fact that you are up before all your peers and there's just something quite nice and invigorating about being up before the rest of the crowd. And, yeah. and again, it's just about being that little bit different and being happy with it. Yeah, brilliant. Hannah, I, I'd, I'd like to talk about your, kind of, your high points of your career, obviously. Yeah. You've been Olympian, Commonwealth Games, World Championships, Euros, etc., etc. If you were to, to pick a particular highlight, perhaps one or two, what would they be and, and perhaps why? It's different. And the funny thing is, is when you speak to an athlete, what their highlight is, it's normally because they've won a medal. And nice. I guess one of my highlights, well, a couple of my highlights will be because I've been on a podium. And I'll throw in the fourth place at Rio as well, because that was an incredibly difficult time, I guess, because you, you, know, you just miss an Olympic medal by 50 hundredths of a second. But... Um, you know, it's an Olympic Games. It was my third Games. Not many people my age were still competing in the event that I'm doing. And to progressively get uh, a higher place on each Games, it was actually just, you know, it was quite nice, but bittersweet at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and I am proud of that performance. I do realize and understand it now, the benefit of my self as an athlete and as an individual i'm so i'm worth so much more than just the medal the materialistic items so winning medals and being on the podium is great defending my title in glasgow like for me that was just one of the best highlights ever because i got to sing the national anthem i was under so much pressure that year and i genuinely was doubting myself quite a fair bit so for my patience consistency and determination it all came together at the right point and I had to wait an awful long time for that to show through and all of it just made it so much more worthwhile for that moment. Um, and it's not just me that stands on the podium. I feel like my family's there, my fiance's there as well. Like there's so many people that put a lot of work and effort into it. But one of the other highlights, and I do struggle to kind of pinpoint it to just one, but being able to travel, but also being able to travel with my dad um, because he puts in so much time and effort for my career and he wasn't a full-time coach. He's a helicopter pilot. So coaching oh, well. for him was kind of on the side. <laughs> um, and there was times where I wasn't fully coached. He was away flying, you know, over the North Sea and, and stuff on a platform. And wow. he messaged me being, I can't come back for coaching. Here's the main set. If you can try and get in a lane in the pool and just get that on. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I would go in after school. Sometimes I'd be on my own and I'd just get on with the session myself. And he had to put a lot of trust that I would do it because obviously it would be very easy to be like, 
at home, be go, you know, get home, put my feet up, be a little, you know, and, you know, just say, yeah, yeah, I've done it, but I haven't. Um, I would feel so guilty knowing that I couldn't, you know, I couldn't do that. So I'd stick with it and do it. So he had, he, we developed trust in each other, I guess, in that sort of sense. So the highlights, I think, is definitely the travel side, you know, being able to see different countries and get exposed to different cultures and um, yeah. different places that you think, you know what, I'd love to go back there again. Fingers crossed when COVID and all that's over, we do get to, a chance to travel again because it is amazing. Yeah um but yeah I, i've made some really good friends uh, across the world that uh, I, you know will be friends for life um which yeah. i guess kind of gets all put into that bracket of being a highlight um yeah where's yeah. your favorite place you've been hannah um, you uh, again i'm gonna cheat slightly i've got two places uh one yeah. is italy oh my god right. pizza and ice cream amazing it's so good over there it's never the same anywhere else <laughs> um but yeah rome is just beautiful the the food is just extraordinary the weather's amazing and to swim in as well is just you know the pool facilities they've got are so fantastic um and the other country is japan uh, there's just something so quirky about japan which is just lovely they have a gadget for everything and i have never been to a place where there are so many controls and buttons on a toilet um <laughs> it's weird you can press a button and it makes a noise and sings to you and there's another button to make it like heat the toilet seat up and there's lights and it is um, unbelievable and they're so polite like their culture yeah. is just so polite and you know respect and um, even at competitions, they bow to the crowd, they bow to the officials before they start. And as soon as they finish their race, again, they bow to the crowd and bow to the officials, you know, lots of thank yous and making sure you're okay. And um, it's just a fascinating country. So for me, those are kind of like my two go-to places that I would love to go back and explore and visit. Yeah. More. Brilliant. Sounds far too cultural for us, Mr. McHugh, doesn't it? Uh, it's certainly no Benidorm or Tenerife or anything like that, is it? It's... In the, East End of Glasgow, do you, Mr. Uh, McHugh? It cost a deal time, that's what they say. <laughs> Hannah, obviously, like everything, there's high points and there's also yep. low points in your career. Yep. Um, obviously, I started to panic last night when we we seen that it was on your Instagram that you'd been yeah. in football. Um, can you tell us a wee bit about that and then perhaps any other setbacks you've had in, in your career? Yeah, I guess, again, this has kind of been a little bit of a low point for me being injured because I've normally been pretty good at staying injury-free. And, you know, it can be the luck of the draw. It's just everything has to line up for you to get injured. Sometimes it's necessarily something you can avoid. Yeah. Um, but I kind of felt pretty happy that, you know, I've managed into my late 30s, that, sorry, early 30s, that I've um, staved away from anything too major that's kind of taken me out the, the water. So for me, I had shoulder surgery last Wednesday to repair a tear that was in my rotator cuff muscle. So basically the muscle that controls that movement, which is swimming, is quite important <laughs> and um and yeah and I, i'd struggled with it over the last couple of years I, I really had a lot of pain with it scans came back clear and it was just frustrating because i knew that i wasn't giving my best i wasn't able to give my best because i was always being held back by the pain and not wanting to make it worse and you just in that turmoil of but you want to keep going you want to just keep pushing through because you think oh, i'll be fine I, you know my body will sort itself out but when I found out, like, not that long ago, like a, a couple of weeks ago, that actually I had quite a significant tear, A, there was a bit of relief to find out, okay, I know what's wrong with it. But then there's the other yeah. side of, oh, the timing of it couldn't have been worse. And it was hard, especially with going through lockdown. I, you know, I felt like, why couldn't have this happened before lockdown had happened? I could have got sorted there and then. Then I could have enjoyed lockdown to recover. But, you know, in hindsight, everything, I do believe everything happens for a reason. And for me, it's given me a good chance to work on my mindset, work on the positivity and actually be like, you know what, at the end of the day, I want to be able to swim and do sport pain free. So regardless of what happens next year, I still want to target Tokyo next year. But I've got to be kind to myself and listen to what my body needs and get through it. But injury injury sucks injury is not good and you know it takes you away from what you love doing it, it can really put you in a dark place in your head um and it takes and nobody can help you well you can get people to help you out of it but it takes real guts and effort yourself to really overcome it and get the right mindset to pull yourself through it because it can and will get better but everybody's journey through it will be different and the journey i'm having right now with it you know there's a couple of days that have been great and then it'll drop and I'll have bad days and then I'll have good days. So it's a real roller coaster with my good days and bad days and the pain levels and yeah. setting myself little goals and just 
you know, not setting them too high that I then suddenly feel demoralized if I can't reach them. I've got to be quite realistic and just make them small, small and little. And, you know, every week just keeping on top of it. And there's going to be times where, yep, I can achieve it. Oh, no, I can't. And if I don't, then I just need to give myself time to be able to get back to it. So it's kind of reworking on my patience and consistency a little bit more because uh, sometimes yeah. you can kind of forget about it. But yeah, injury, I guess, is kind of at the minute, this has been a bit of a downer. Uh, and I got really emotional as well because I feel the age that I'm at, I'm up against a lot of younger swimmers coming through. Mm. And I don't want people to assume that that's me done and that's me finished. And there's all these other bits that kind of come into play, but I've kind of been able to turn it around into a bit of a positive and I hope people would like to follow my journey. And if they ever do come across with an injury that, you know, I can hopefully provide information and support that it is possible to get through it um, yeah. and kind of find your own way. But yeah, that, that's kind of been a bit of a dark period. And I guess as well, going back to Rio, I know I added that in my highlight, but as well, that was a bit of a disappointment too, because I had this expectation of coming away with a medal and to be so close. I mean, get a stopwatch and try and start stop and get 15 hundredths of a second. It's so marginal, so small. Yeah. Um, and that was the difference between, you know, being on the podium and not being on the podium, flying home, turning left and being in first class and business class with all the medalists to then being sat in a seat next to the toilet and all the little sort of gimmicks that you get when you get a medal because you've put on this pedestal. Yeah. And I felt, you know, you work so hard and to come away with nothing, it makes you feel worthless. So all those moments that I've had that have been not so good, I've really worked hard to actually see that there is always something good in them. There's always that lesson to be learned. And those experiences really do define you as an individual because it's how you overcome them and how you accept them and deal with them. I think that makes you who you are. So yeah. I wouldn't say they're necessarily a bad thing to have because everybody yeah. has them. It's okay to have them. But it's good to kind of recognise them. I think. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we Hannah, we spend a lot of time talking to uh, senior classes about training, uh, different types of training and training regimes. Um, and we've spoken, at, obviously, during this podcast about uh, training and the fact that Remy trains in the morning. What What would be a kind of typical day or a week for you in terms of your training? Um, so I can give you what it was like before lockdown. Um, so my, my alarm would go off at half past four in the morning. Um, I know. Well, the funny thing is, is I get, I get up that early because I need to take the dog out for the toilet. And to be honest, she oh. looks at me as if to go, why <laughs> but i know if i you know if she if she gets left she'll then be squeaking you know you need the toilet as soon as you wake up so i kind of have to let her out so i let her out i have my breakfast and it takes me a long time to eat breakfast so i need to give myself time and then i'm at the pool from half five until eight um doing my session and then once i've finished um some sessions i go straight into the gym and i'm, I'm in doing strength and conditioning from half eight till half ten other days i'll come back and have second breakfast at my home and then I'll maybe have a little power nap um, and then walk the dog, grab a bit of lunch and I'm back at the pool again for about quarter past four until half past six in the evening. So each day is a little bit different depending on what I do land work wise during the day. Monday, Wednesdays, Fridays, I had the two hour strength and conditioning session. Tuesday, I had like an hour of conditioning um, and Thursday was uh, like Pilates and mobility work. Uh, Saturdays were always our tough sessions um, in the morning and once we finished it we always finish with a, a really tough 40 minute uh, poolside circuit as well um, so yeah so it kind of it, it was full on <laughs> so, yeah. so obviously that, that's pretty intense Hannah so A where do you find where do you find the time to, to switch off and B what, what do you do to switch off um, I quite enjoy TV um, sometimes online shopping or coloring in as well i'm <laughs> just kind of all the usual stuff we're reading but at the minute my kind of big sort of switch off factor has been poppy uh my dog she's just been incredible especially during lockdown um just spending time with her teaching her different tricks um and being able really? to play with her or even just going on a walk as well that's been actually quite helpful for allowing my head to switch off um yeah. and then sometimes just finding music so at the minute we don't have a dishwasher so i have to wash the dishes uh, finding like different podcasts to listen to at the minute I'm really into I think is it like r slash reddit kind of uh, podcast where you get 
um, stories of entitled parents or stories. That's what you were meant to say about the Bishy PE podcast. That, that was my big plug. Well, I've got now, I can, I've got 26 other episodes to listen to, so I can. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to keep me occupied for quite some time now doing the dishes. Um, uh, but yeah, so little things like that I kind of enjoy. Um, and yeah. try to find something new to learn, like. Even again, during lockdown, I learned how to French braid my hair, which I hadn't, obviously I can't do that now. Um, but I, you know, I, you know, thir- age of 30, 31, I kind of thought, I really need to learn how to do this because I always get amazed with some of these people that can do some incredible things with their hair and all I do is pineapple it. So <laughs> I felt I need to teach myself something like that. Um, so yeah, so I'm up for always trying to teach something. And I've actually been really tempted to try and learn how to do like crocheting, mainly because I want to make Poppy a scarf or a little doggy hat. But... You, I, I'm just get that, get that bishy P a swimming cap if you want there you go <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah so I'm always up for trying different things to just help me uh, relax and unwind yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, good. we we, uh, we also speak to our kids about the mental side um, kind of things like mental rehearsal positive self talk um, yeah. what would you do just kind of leading up to a, maybe a big race you know, what would you, your mental rehearsal be um, I use music for that and I try and do a bit of visualization um, and yeah. I always try and remind myself of the positivity sandwich. Um, so if you come away with a competition that doesn't go well, uh, I try and find, because it's very easy to pick on the things that don't go well, but even in the swim that doesn't go well, there are always things to find out that are positive. Even saying I started the race and I finished the race, <laughs> you know, pick two things that went really well and then one thing that you think I could improve on that or that didn't work so well. And then once you've got that, okay, what are the component, components you need to work on to move on from it? And then you're able to kind of park it or eat the sandwich and uh, sort of move on to your next swim. So part of it is a little bit of reminding yourself of not over, but yeah, I kind of dig myself a little hole here. It's not about overthinking, because I think the more you overthink about it, the bigger the hole you seem to dig yourself. And sometimes you can overthink. Um, is trying to stay relaxed and calm and realize that A, it's just another competition. I've done these hundreds of times before. This is what I train to do. So the less you think and the more you just do, I think is really important. And that's where music comes in for me, is being able to find tunes that make me happy, that make me excited. And I feel like, oh, that's a great motivational you know, build up. I try and spend maybe like the week before finding tunes, going onto Spotify and just creating a playlist every competition the playlist is maybe a little bit different and that process of finding music just helps me a realize okay i've got competition coming up but i'm not thinking about who am i racing against it's a competition ah, and start get panicky i enjoy it because i enjoy looking for music and just that association of enjoyment relaxed but confidence as well i think kind of helps yeah What's your jam? What's your, your go-to song, Hannah? Oh, it varies, and it obviously changes from time to time. I've gone through a phase where I really enjoy the band Elephant Sessions, um, right. and yeah. they've got a song called Colours. Uh, afterwards, yeah. if you ever look at it, I, I really enjoy their music. It's um, They're a Scottish band, I think, based up in, up in the Highlands, um, yeah. but they've got some really jazzy kind of music. No worries, it's just all instrumental stuff. Um, there's other bits where I, I try and not go for the mainstream music because they just get played to death and I listen to these songs on repeat all the time and if I hear them on the radio it's like no change the song <laughs> um, so I really try and find obscure songs um, I, sometimes I listen to an artist called Lindsay Sterling I actually got my phone here um, let's see what some of the other sort of albums I've got so many different albums as well right let's yeah, go we've, got, we've got and we've got the fitness suite open Remy's usually in charge of the music she's got this, this guy called Xander Nation okay I'll have a little look at that yeah, it, have, a look, <laughs> have a look that'll get you that'll get you pumped up that, that's gonna be <laughs> oh, I'll check it out um, okay so there's Get Low by Dylan Francis and DJ Snake uh, a bit of David Guetta a um, bit of Kendrick Lamar Marshmallow Medusa uh, um, there's one called uh, uh, Angles, A- I don't, don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right, A-N-G-L-S, called Chasing an Echo. That was a theme tune for the European Champs in Glasgow. Uh, Panic Room by Camel Fat, um, Panic at the Disco, Gorgon oh, City, Beyonce. So it's it's a real eclectic mix. Um, That's the, the pre-match tune sorted for this Saturday, Mr McHugh. I can see a couple of assists for you, <laughs> definitely. There you go. <laughs> swiftly, swiftly moving on. 
Uh, Remy, you're up next. Um, was controlling your emotions something that you'd done within training or was it something that you'd done by yourself? I don't really control my emotions very well. <laughs> I wear my heart on my sleeve. Um, I, if I'm really happy, I can get quite upset and overwhelmed or I just smile a lot. Or if I get upset or feel disappointed, like I can, uh, I'll can, i try really hard to kind of not bowl my eyes out, but I will find a way to kind of bowl my eyes out. It is hard, but I think it's important to to be emotional because I think it's important to just let yourself be you and not try and hide it. Um, and for, you know, especially if things are really good and you're enjoying them, then let it show. Obviously, don't go too overboard. So you're rubbing it in people's faces. No one likes a bit of a show off. But you know, the happy moments, enjoy them. But if they don't go well and you're upset, it is okay to be upset, and it is okay to show your disappointment. But make sure that you do let yourself have that moment to let it out, deal with it, and then able to move on from it. Don't try and bottle it up. Uh, for me, one of my biggest issues, I think, was probably from coming forth at the Olympics in Rio. I haven't watched my interview yet, actually, since then. But I know that I was really fighting to just let my emotion out. And I really wish I had because I think it would have just let people understand what I was going through because I was so happy that it was the best performance I'd ever done. But so disappointed at the same time that it wasn't quite that goal that I wanted of being able to come away with a medal. Um, because then everyone just felt really sorry for me and I didn't want people feeling sorry for me. I just wanted people to sort of be like, you know what, you did everything you could and we're happy and proud of you. Um, and yeah, but yeah, that's a very good question. And, you know, you can sort of work and deal with those emotions as you go along. And I think it's important to be able to look at them and understand it. Um, for me, one of the best sort of tools that I had uh, was getting a piece of paper and drawing a line down the middle and then write can control and can't control. So coming up to a big competition, I would sit and write all the things that I can control, things that I know that will make a difference because I have input into them. So packing my swimming bag, what race suit I wear, the food that I eat, towels, clothing, you know, all those little things. And then I'd list all the things that I had no control over. So who I was racing against, the official that was standing behind my blocks, the water temperature, the atmosphere, like all those things. And I think once I identified knowing, okay, these are the things that I can't control, I could kind of put them to one side and just focus in on what it was that I could control. And that yeah. helped me kind of manage my emotions a little bit better coming into me, but also afterwards as well. Cause there are times where you can get really frustrated and stressed over something that you can't control. And it's a good exercise to try and remind yourself of being able to put a one side because even being able to physically cut that paper in half and actually put those things you've written as being uncontrollables either in the bin or to one side so you don't see it. So you're physically removing it from your head. Um, for me, that was kind of one way of being able to sort of work on my emotions. But yeah, there's no, there's no harm in being emotional because it shows that you care yeah. about what you do. That's excellent. Yeah. Uh, and I think you spoke a wee bit earlier on about goal setting. Mm -hmm. um, so, have you got any goals going forward? Um, you've spoken how you, you're kind of setting smaller goals um, yeah. just with regards to the injury. Um, yeah. So, at the minute, one of my main goals is being able to put my arms up in the streamlined position. Because <laughs> my right, right okay. can do this, but I'm not allowed to do that with my left arm just yet. So, that's one goal. Um, my main goal at the minute is to get myself back to peak fitness, to be able to assuming trials still go ahead to then be able to compete at the Olympic trials and see if I can try and qualify for a fourth Olympic games. Um, but yeah, I've lots of little goals. Uh, sometimes I do forget. So it is important to maybe write them down. Sometimes I used to write them down and stick them on the back of my door. So that was the first thing I saw in the morning and last thing at night. Um, and also just helps remind you because sometimes we can set goals and be like, yeah, I'm going to aim it for that. And then, you know, a bit like New Year's resolutions, <laughs> they tend to disappear slightly. <laughs> they don't last um, <laughs> Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, so at the minute I've just got the small goals for working on my shoulder rehab. Um, and yeah, I I'm kind of reminding myself to actually blog or vlog or be able to speak to my phone and video my feelings each day uh that is kind of a goal because i've not been very good at doing little bits like that so i want to try and document my journey of going through the rehab yeah. and, as i say record the good days but also record the bad days as well because everyone yeah. does and i think it's important we... to show them sometimes and yeah. so yes yeah, so, apologies i can't really give you a specific no, answer no, no, no. those goals <laughs> right Remy, back to you hey, what advice would you give to young aspiring swimmers uh, the best bit of advice I would give would be be kind to yourself. 
Um, we can be very, very hard on ourselves, whether it's in training, uh, whether it's with our expectations, uh, and also, you know, assuming the expectations from maybe parents or coaches. Um, be kind to yourself and remember that you are you and where you're at. You know, you're not going to be at that position forever. A lot of kids get really upset if they plateau and they don't feel that they improve. Patience and consistency, there's always something to work on. Just because your times aren't improving doesn't mean that's the end of the world. Everybody hits that plateau stage. That's where the goal setting becomes important. Look at something that's not time-based. Look at something that's technical. Work on your technique because all those little components that work together will come together in order that will help you drop time. Um, even my best competition actually was uh, in 2014 at the Commonwealth Games. And I dropped time in... I think about four or five of my events and I was at 25 and I was still PBing. Um, so sometimes it's not about the PBs. It's, you know, about how you swim the race and uh, how you achieve that race strategy or race process. So uh, definitely be kind to yourself. Uh, it is kind of a key thing. Brilliant. Brilliant. Good. Uh, Hannah, I've got the last question. Uh, it's a really fun finisher. We're looking for any five dinner guests or party guests. Um, from any, any walk of life, who would they be and why? Okay, notes. Well, my first one would be Misty Hyman. Uh, she is my ultimate hero in swimming. Um, and I, I actually have had dinner with her before, but I'd love to have dinner with her again. Um, <laughs> but so I was surprised 30th birthday. Uh, my fiance managed to set up that I actually got to meet her and I just like, cried when I saw her. Um, but she's my ultimate hero in swimming. I just love her for who she is and a, as a person. Um, so yeah, so I'd happily have dinner with Misty again. Uh, David Attenborough as well, because I think I could just sit and listen to him talk all the time and his knowledge on the world and uh, just... Yeah, he's just an awesome person to sort of, you know, yeah, <laughs> just ask questions. You probably won't even have time to just ask questions. Just being able to listen to what he's got to say would be amazing. Uh, Robin Williams as well. Uh, he's my all-time favorite comedian. And uh, it's very sad that he's obviously not with us anymore. But he's <clears throat> an awesome, awesome guy. It would be awesome to kind of figure out what he was like as a person. Yeah. Um, what? Oh, goodness. I would probably go with... My mind's gone blank. It's like when they say, what's your favourite movie? And you're like, oh, uh, and no movies come to your head. I probably... The one name that keeps popping into my head, and I'm not quite sure why, it's Beyonce. Because I feel like I would like to see, you know, sit down and have dinner with another female because she's an incredible icon and role model. And I just love her voice, like so jealous of, you know, being able, if I wasn't a swimmer, I, this one skill I would love to have would be able to sing. <laughs> That'd be absolutely incredible. Um, and the next person uh, would be probably Hugh Jackman. He's like my celebrity crush and I love Marvel films like Wolverine for me. I just, yeah, he was my favorite character in X-Men as well. Um, and yeah, it'd be kind of cool to have dinner. So. Brilliant. Excellent. Excellent. Hannah, that brings to close um, the uh, latest episode and our interview with yourself. Thank you so much once again. No worries. Thanks for having me. Um, Thanks very much, Hannah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Lovett and Remy for joining us. They're a smashing job, Remy, so well done, pal. Thank um, you, Remy. Oh, so if you want to purchase any Bishop Briggs, Hi. <laughs> plug for Mr. McQuaid. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've got a special, special deal. Um, <laughs> you can catch this episode and the other 26 um, on our YouTube page and on our Twitter at Bishy P. Thank you very much, folks. Have a great night. Take care. See you later. Thank you. Thanks, Remy. Thanks, Hannah. Yeah.